Hi, uh, welcome back to Wednesdays in the Word. It's good to be with you again. I'm by myself this week, uh, but it is what it is. And if anybody else wants to uh, join me in future weeks, I imagine Olivia will probably join me again next week. But this week is just crazy busy for me. And uh, so here I am. And looking forward to continuing now. Remember last week, God kind of hit the pause button. Uh, on the story of Joseph, and we were left kind of hanging with him being sold into slavery uh, by his brothers, which is an absolutely horrific story. Then uh, we kind of had a pause for a minute and explored uh, the family tree of, of Jesus in Judah and Tamar. Now we are back in chapter 39. Uh, with the continuation of the story of Joseph. So without uh, any further ado, let's dig in here. Remember, Joseph had been sold uh, into slavery. Um, he had been sold to a traveling band of Ishmaelites who then got to Egypt and sold him into slavery. So um, he was about 17 or 18 years old when that happened, when he was sold. All right, chapter 39. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. All right, <laughs> it's important for us to kind of take note of this uh, here. Joseph is successful because the Lord is with him. Um, but even if he's not successful, the Lord is with him. Um, the Lord is with Joseph. It's, um, it's kind of uh, an interesting technique that we see here at the beginning and end of chapter 39 is bracketed by this statement that the Lord is with Joseph. It's important for us to remember that and that he is successful because the Lord is with him. And also, I think we get um, the sense that Joseph has an awareness that God is with him, that Yahweh, the Lord, is with him. And it's important to know that that is Yahweh, uh, the Lord, who is with him because Joseph is in now a land that has... Uh, a lot of uh, different gods. It's a it's a land of polygamy, not polygamy, um, polytheistic, um, and uh, so they worship many gods. But it is the one true God who is with Joseph, and he is named. Um, I think I've talked about this before to some of you, uh, but uh, for those of you who maybe this is new. When you notice any time in your Bible um, the word Lord that is in small capital letters, small caps, that is the proper name of God, Yahweh. It is the name that is given to him as you're given to us that God tells us is his proper name. Um, and it's given to Moses. Um, at the beginning of Exodus, in Exodus chapter 3. And you've heard that maybe translated or read that translated as I am. The way that translates in Hebrew is the letters Y-H-W-H. -H. And um, there are no vowel points um, with that. So we kind of guess at the vowels that go with that. Yahweh, Y-A-H-W-E-H. That is the name in Hebrew. It is the proper name of the Lord God. It is translated then into English um, as uh, Lord, L-O-R-D, capital letters. Uh, it's a complicated reason that it's translated with that word Lord. Um, I'll simplify it by saying that the name of God, the holy name of God, the proper name of God, Yahweh, is so sacred um, to the Jewish people um, and even for many years was to the Christian people that it was never spoken 
So whenever they would come across it in reading, and this continues to the day to this day, um, the name is not read aloud because there is a fear that you would dishonor the name somehow. So they substitute the word Adonai, which means Lord. So when we see um, the word Lord, we are seeing actually, in Hebrew, it's written as the proper name, Yahweh, um, but it is spoken as Adonai, Lord, and that's why we see it. That happens eight times in this chapter. Um, it, uh, it, we are made very aware that the Lord is uh, with Joseph and that the Lord is giving him what he needs to be successful. All right. So, um, continuing on, um, verse 4, um, Joseph found favor in Potiphar's eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time that he put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. All right, so here we are seeing what's come true, what God promised Abraham way back when. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. Joseph is being blessed um, because of the faithfulness of God to his promise. Potiphar is treating Joseph well, and so Potiphar is being blessed as a result of that. All right, so he puts Joseph essentially kind of in charge, like his like right-hand man or whatever, um, in charge of uh, his household. It puts um, uh, Joseph in, it leaves everything in Joseph's care because Potiphar has um, traveling and work and stuff to do. And that's all well and good, except then all of a sudden um, in verse 7, we are um, introduced to Mrs. Potiphar, who is a cougar. <laughs> There's no polite way to put this here, um, but uh, she does not have good intentions here. Uh, now, Joseph was well built and handsome, and after a while... His master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. This is a, I'm kind of a command, actually. She, um, you know, she's married to uh, his owner, essentially. Uh, but um, he doesn't. He refuses, we're told. In verse 8, he refused. Uh, and then he says, with me in charge, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns has been entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. All right. Um, so Joseph makes it pretty clear. Look, uh, I'm not going to do this because Potiphar has trusted me with a lot and um that would be doing the wrong thing, and I'm not going to violate his trust. But notice here, Joseph goes on and kind of even solidifies the deal. He says, how then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Joseph has integrity. He knows what is the right thing to do, not only from um, uh, the standpoint of his faith, and his belief in the one true God, but he also has integrity and in that he's not going to violate the trust of his master. And so he um, refuses to sleep with Potiphar's wife while well, she's not happy uh, with that decision. So she keeps nagging at him day after day, we're told, and um, he keeps refusing. And finally, he shows up one day at the house and nobody is there except her. And she, um, this is a trap. And essentially what happens is, and I'll let you read this for yourself, but essentially what happens is she tries to convince him uh, to sleep with her thinking, well, surely he'll agree now because there's nobody around to see 
that this has happened and he um, still refuses but um, she tries to grab onto him and grabs his cloak and he uh, essentially wiggles out of it and leaves her there holding the cloak <laughs> Well, guess what? She turns around and makes this whole thing up, uh, uh, this story about uh, him trying to rape her. And, um, of course, Potiphar believes his wife, and so he throws Joseph into prison, and Joseph ends up in prison. All right, now I want you to look down in verse 21. Remember I said this chapter here is bracketed with reassurances of the Lord's presence with Joseph. While Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was re made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. So again, the same kind of thing happens as happened in Potiphar's house. The Lord was with Joseph. Joseph maintains his connection and everything uh, uh, with, with God Almighty. The Lord prospers or kind of... Um, Helps Joseph have some success. Joseph is put in charge at Potiphar's house. Um, that goes badly. He ends up in prison, but the Lord is with Joseph even there in prison. And Joseph now is put in charge of the prisoners. So then what happens when they are, when he's in prison is that all of a sudden um, there are two officials from Pharaoh's court that end up in prison, the cupbearer and the baker and they end up in prison and Joseph has charge over them well lo and behold they have dreams remember Joseph earlier at the very beginning of the story uh, had dreams interestingly enough the dreams that Joseph had when he was a kid were not interpreted and um, he didn't have the ability to interpret those at least we're not told that he did um, but now, all of a sudden, here he is in this bad situation, and he is given the ability to interpret dreams. Um, they, both of the cupbearer and the baker come to him and say, we had these bad dreams. And, and they were like, can you tell us what they might mean? And Joseph's response is, interpretations belong to God, uh, but tell me your dreams, and I'll see... Uh, what God has to say and so he interprets their dreams he interprets the dream first of the cupbearer and that's a favorable interpretation that the cupbearer is going to be restored to his position verse 14 um, then Joseph tells the cupbearer he says when all goes well with you remember me and show me kindness mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison for I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I have done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. We see for a minute here, Joseph gets, uh, and who wouldn't? I mean, he gets real personal. He's like, look, I'm here um, for all the wrong reasons. I'm here because I was sold by my brothers. I'm here because, uh, you know, my owner's wife wanted me to have sex with her, and I wouldn't. Um, so what he does then with this cupbearer is like, look, I did you a solid. Will you do me one? Um, and so um, then the baker has a dream also that he tells Joseph, and Joseph interprets that as well. Uh, and both of those uh, come true. But then at the end of chapter 40, uh, we are given just this really kind of sad uh, commentary here. The chief cupbearer, however did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. Can you imagine being Joseph? I mean, three days, uh, the cupbearer and the baker are both taken out of prison, and he's like probably hoping um, and counting on this cupbearer, uh, mentioning him to Pharaoh and getting him out of prison, and nothing happens. Uh, it, it doesn't happen. Um, this is a really 
kind of a, a sad time for Joseph. Um, now we move into chapter 41, and we're told when two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream. <clears throat> All right, so Joseph waits two more years uh, in prison. And then Pharaoh has um, actually two dreams. All right, so how old is Joseph? He's probably about 28 now. Um, and we, we get that number because we know that <coughs> then later um, we're told that he's 30 when um, he interprets the dreams of Pharaoh. So <coughs> he's 28 when the cupbearer leaves uh, prison and waits another two years. All right, um, and we don't know how long he was in prison, and we don't know how long he served for Potiphar, and that really doesn't matter. All right, Pharaoh has two dreams. Um, these are familiar stories to those of us who grew up in the faith. I don't know about you, but I can remember um, tons of um, uh, Sunday school stories and stuff about these dreams of Pharaoh, flannel graph uh, pictures, if any of you remember flannel graph, uh, all of those things. Um, so Pharaoh has these dreams, and oh, all of a sudden then, uh, verse 9, the chief cupbearer, Lo and behold, remembers. And he's like, dang, I forgot. And so he then says to Pharaoh, he says, Today I am reminded of my shortcomings. Uh, I forgot to tell you. But there's this guy that I was in prison with, and he's really good at interpreting dreams, and he can probably <coughs> tell you the meaning of yours. All right, so Sarah, Pharaoh sends for Joseph. Tells him his uh, dreams about the uh, seven fat calves and the seven lean calves and then the seven heads of grain and the seven um, yucky uh, heads of grain. And then Joseph um, interprets this. But notice, again, Joseph makes it very clear that this does not come from him alone. In verse 16... Joseph tells Pharaoh, he's like, I can't do this by myself, but God will give you the answer that you desire. All right, so then the, um, the dreams are interpreted to mean that they're going to have seven years of abundance and good crops, and then seven years, that'll be followed by seven years of no crops, drought, famine. Uh, and so... Um, then if we, um, uh, go down to verse 31 in chapter 41, um, Joseph says the abundance in the land will not be remembered because the famine that follows it will be so severe. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God and God will do it soon. So pay attention, Pharaoh. This is a serious issue. Y'all are going to have some problems here, and you need to get a hand on it. Uh, and then he gives Pharaoh some advice. He says, you need to have somebody who is wise and discerning and put them in charge of how to handle this. You need to collect and save back during the years of abundance enough grain because when then we hit the hard times, there will be enough for the people to eat. And the plan sounds good to Pharaoh and his officials. And then Pharaoh is like, well, why look for anybody else? Uh, we've got a guy here who has this perfect plan uh, all laid out. And so then he puts Joseph in charge. Verse 39, Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. Once again, God is with Joseph and is blessing him 
and making him successful. And so Joseph then is elevated to this great position of power. And we are told that he then in verse 46, um, well, first before that, um, <clears throat> he is given an uh, Egyptian name, an Egyptian wife, and uh, he's given this, this power. He's like second in command, essentially, uh, in Egypt. We're told in verse 46 <clears throat> that Joseph was 30 years old. All right, and uh, so here he is. He's been set in charge of all of this stuff. Um, a little farther down in verse 50, I want you to notice something here. So Joseph has been essentially Egyptianized, um, but I want you to notice something. In verse 50, before the years of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph uh, by his wife. Joseph, even though he's been Egyptianized, names gives his children Hebrew names. <coughs> he names his first son Manasseh. And uh, that kind of means, um, because this has been such a great thing, Manasseh's name means kind of like to forget. And he does that because he says, you know, the joy of all of this has made me forget like what got me here in the first place and all of the troubles that I've endured. And then the second son is Ephraim, which means twice fruitful. Pay attention to those names <coughs> and keep them in your memory bank. Those names will be important at the end of Joseph's story. I have a horrible tickle. All right. So finally, at the end of chapter 41, we find out that what Joseph had interpreted has come true. <coughs> and there's been seven years of good and abundant harvest, and now there is a famine. And we're told at the end of chapter 41, all the countries came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph <coughs> because the famine was severe in all the world. All right. So what Joseph has done has um, set things up. And actually what God has done is set things up um, to uh, figure very significantly here in uh, the rest of the story. Uh, and for those of you who know the end of the story, you know what's coming. For those of you who don't, um, I'll give you a little bit of a teaser in that Joseph will be at long last reunited with his brothers. And how will he act? Let's wait and see. All right, thanks for joining me this week. Let's close our time together in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for the gift of your word. We thank you for the truth that this lesson for us contains, that no matter what happens to us, you are always with us, and that you help us even when things look the bleakest. Lord, we're in a time when things look bleak. We ask you to help us remember that you are with us and that you are blessing us. Help us to look for those blessings and see your hand upon us. I pray for all of us, Lord, uh, uh, this next week. Help us to have a good week to do good to others, and to share the gospel when we have opportunities to do so. We pray this all in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks for joining me today. It was good to have you with me, and I will see you again next week.